in this area this morning and you chose to come here. We are so thankful for that. If you haven't already, we have a gift for you over at the Welcome Center. Uh, it's just our gift to you just to say thank you for coming. And so if you would, just spend by there and make sure you pick this up before you leave today. Church, are we excited to have some visitors with us this morning? Secondly, I wanted to update you on a few things. We do have the Super Bowl of Caring going on right now. We saw the Halifax Urban Ministries truck parked out there, and it's going very well. The van is getting very full, which is a wonderful thing to have happening. So thank you so much for everyone who has donated to that, who has helped load, who's dropped off canned food either today or during the week. Thank you. All of that is going to go to help needy families in our area. And what a way to be a blessing to our community, right? I also I have another update for you, because if you remember last month, we had a shoe and sock drive for the homeless. So, yes, praise the Lord, right? We had 92 pairs of shoes, not even individual shoes, pairs of shoes. <laughs> yes, and so such a blessing. We also had 112 bags of socks, like packages of socks. Again, that could not happen without your generosity. Thank you for being willing to give and to sacrifice to be a blessing to our community. All of these went right to homeless in our area, which is the way this weather is. It's such a blessing to them. And so, again, thank you for that. God is good, right? Amen. All right. And one, one last thing, too. We, when you came in, you should have gotten these. So we have not done this in several years here at Crossroads, but we wanted to do Friend Day which is a day where we're encouraging everyone to invite a friend to come to Crossroads for that day. It's going to be March 5th. It's going to be the big day. Every guest who's here that day is going to get a special gift, very nice gift. It's exciting. I'm very excited to get to give that to them. And I just want to encourage you to invite your friends. This booklet here uh, will walk you through the process of deciding who to invite, encourage you to pray for them until that day, and then actually inviting them to church. This booklet here will help guide you through that. So I want to encourage you to read it and to pray about who God would have you to invite. And when God shows you who to invite, one of your friends or multiple friends, we have these special invite cards made up for those days. And so it's got where they can go. It even has a little tear-off part. If you want to put their information on there and give that to us, we'll reach out to them and you know encourage them to come as well. And it helps us to know how many to plan for too. So be praying for who God would have you to invite March 5th. So, all right, let's get back to worship. Thanks, Cody. Let's all stand up. What a blessing that is. 
Let's bless the Lord. Let's sing this out. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. I worship His holy name. I sing like never before. Oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. That's right. Come on. This
here, so I just want you guys to know that this was the message that was waiting on me for my Bible. Remember, 30 minutes max. <laughs> Hold on, it's not over. If you go over, I will start doing squats in the middle of the service. So, you don't have to worry about that, but anyway. Hey, if you would, open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1 this morning. Colossians chapter 1. And uh, what I want to do this morning... Uh, God has always done this with me in my messages and in how I'm working. So I have a couple of caveats to put out before the message starts. Number one, I can never really speak very far from where God is working in my own personal life. I've just never been able to uh, talk about things that God isn't doing in me personally. Now, that being said... That doesn't mean you have to take what I say personally. It just means that God, that I'm relaying to you something that God is working with me on. Secondly, it has to do with the idea that, look, we're, we're in a decision-making time in our church. Amen? Amen? And as we get into this process of looking for the next pastor that God would have for our church, I felt that the message was somewhat appropriate because here's one of the things that I've been really uh, – personally dealing with, and that is, how prepared are we to make that decision? How clear-minded are we? How clean are we? 
How open to the light of God's leading are we? Does everybody understand where I'm going with that? Because remember, you know, God told nations that he would give them leaders after their hearts. Amen. And so that's kind of behind us this morning. And then the last thing is this. There's a typical Bible way. And the Bible way is this. Usually, if you pick out passages, it will say something to this effect. If God did this for you, then that should move you to do something. Amen? Because he's coming back. Hallelujah. Anybody ready right now? I, I mean, I, like just a good solid trumpet sound. Let's call it home. Somebody said to me the other day, they said, oh, I don't know. I want to see the grandkids do this. And then I'm like, really? I'm sure the grandkids will be just fine when they get to glory and they're on streets of paved gold. Amen. So, but, but that's a real Bible principle is that if Jesus Christ has done something for you and changed your life, it ought to compel us to do something. Now, the warning there is because he is coming back and you and I don't know when that's going to occur. Amen? So let me give you a little analogy. I didn't do it in the first service, but... So, <clears throat> in baseball, which some of you know I played, there's nine positions, right? But the problem with baseball is if you're on defense, you never know where the ball's going. So imagine, which by the way, I've seen this happen, might have even happened to me, I'm not positive. Suppose you daydream at your position for just a, just a little bit. Never happened, never done that, nobody's ever said, hey Wade, you know, from third base, because I was always at third base, they'd say things like, you know, your mother wears army boots and all that kind of stuff, right? But you can, you can appreciate, right, that in that moment, boom, something's going to happen because, and you don't know where that ball is going to go, but there's a requirement on your part if you're on the team. You need to be ready. You need to be giving your all because there are eight other men on the field that are counting on you to do your job so that the team wins. Amen. And that's kind of where I'm at this morning. So in Colossians chapter 1, there's this passage that I have been meditating on. And it's just really been grinding in my heart. And let's look together, if you would, at verse 12. The scripture says this. Everybody there? Colossians 1, verse 12, the Bible says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet. That means he's brought us together to be partakers of of the inheritance of the saints, notice the phrase now, in light. That's, I'm going to focus on this in light idea, but let's read the next part. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? Hallelujah. Amen? Now, this idea of power of darkness, I want to say something. It's a person. It's not a thing. This is a person. Who was the person? Well, he was Lucifer. You say, who's that? Amen, Satan. That was Lucifer was his name when he was the light bearer. That is, he was the anointed cherub that sat over the throne of the Lord. And he had on the breastplate of righteousness filled with the jewels of God. And when God's glory radiated up, it caromed off and it lit up all of the world around them. And everyone worshipped. He was the leader of worship. But the Bible tells us that Ezekiel chapter 28, that there was iniquity found in him. And so he went from a light bearer to the prince of darkness. That is, there's no, hear me now, there is no light in him at all. And the Bible tells us that he is the God of this world. So let's do the math equation. If Lucifer, Satan, has no light in him, and he's in charge of this world, that means there's how much light in the world? Let's say it louder. Zero. None. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 5, the whole world lieth in wickedness. Amen? 
So I want you to know that you've been delivered from that. Hallelujah. Yeah, but I don't know if you're like me. Every now and then, for some stupid reason, I got to go see if it still tastes the same. Anybody understand where I'm going at? Yeah, right? That's where we're going to go today. I'm not sure we're supposed to go back and taste anything, you know. But I wanted you to get the picture of who Lucifer is. And also I'd like you to get this idea. Dark, darkness in your Bible is almost always associated with judgment. You say, well, example, book of Exodus. God sent a plague on Egypt. He made it so dark they couldn't see. It's judgment. I'll give you a very good one, one closer to my heart. You see, when I was alive and I was growing and I was developing, and then all of a sudden I would thought that I was living. I thought that I was having light. I thought there was light in me. I thought I was enjoying everything. And then someone preached unto me the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I found out I was darkness. That is, all have sinned. I found out in me there was no good thing. What a great day that is. Can I just take, it take, listen, I mean this. It takes all the pressure off when you realize you're not that good. Amen. And you don't have to try to be. Because you can't be. Why? Because you took on the nature of darkness. Because when you were born into this world after Adam and Eve fell in the garden, you inherited a dark nature. And you couldn't do anything about it. You couldn't get rid of it. You just had to live in it. But the deception was you thought you were walking in light. And then somebody was kind enough to give you the gospel. And so Jesus Christ bore my sin on Calvary. Amen. Amen. But isn't it ironic that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that the world went dark? Because put on him was our darkness. Put on him was our filth. Put on him was the sin of the whole world. Put on him was all transgression. And it quenched the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the world had to turn the lights off because the Father couldn't even look on our iniquity. Amen. Judgment. Darkness. If you're not getting the picture, darkness is not good. Amen? So let's go back to the beginning. So I'd like you to go to Genesis chapter 1. And as you're going there, actually, before you go, I'm sorry, before you go, Colossians chapter 1, I want you to look at one verse in the passage because it's very important. Go down towards the end of the chapter, look, or middle of the chapter, look with me at verse 16. It says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now the Bible tells you in Psalm chapter 90, verse 2, that before the mountains were made, before anything was created, he was from everlasting to everlasting. That is, Christ has no beginning. He has no end. Hebrews 1 puts it this way, that he hath created all things. He's the express image of the Father, and he upholdeth all things by the power of his word. You say, how powerful is that word? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that there's coming a day. When God will have a judgment, it'll call the great white throne judgment. And it said all the great will stand before him, great and small. And the Bible says that God himself will say, roll it up. And everything will flee from before him and will be in nothing but the throne of God. And everything else will have disappeared except for man and his judgment. That's how much power. That's how it's holding together. You're alive today because Jesus Christ lets you. He lets us breathe, and he lets us live for him, and he lets us exist in this life. What a joy that is to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible says that's how much power that he has. And so from the very beginning, there was nothing. 
And the Bible says that he spoke all things into existence. Go to Genesis chapter 1 with me. So that got me thinking about, well, usually in your Bible it's good to go right to the beginning. Amen? Right to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says this, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. I'm going to stop there for just a second. Nobody's ever going to be able to prove it. But it is often thought that it was somewhere between the original forming of the earth and the heavens that Satan rebelled in his rebellion against the Lord when he had his five I wills, that I will ascend up to the Most High, I will be like the Most High God. He wanted to basically usurp the authority of God, amen? And there was the catastrophe. Jesus said it this way, Behold, I saw the prince of this world cast out. And he took angels with him in that rebellion, the Bible says. By the way, those angels are chained in everlasting darkness, 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, I can't prove that, but what I can prove to you is this. That fall took place sometime before God made Adam and Eve because he showed up in the garden. Amen. But the next part's what's interesting. And God said, let there be what? Yeah, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was what? Good. Yeah, he hadn't called the darkness good, amen. The light was good. And God divided, hear me now, the light from the darkness. Now, every week after I preach, I get a text from Clayton. Wade, what is the title of your sermon? Because I never have one, and so then I have to make up one. But today, I thought, I'm going to get out in front on this, and I have a title. You guys ready? Everybody excited? Okay. There is no gray. I'm going to say it again. There's no gray. See, we live in a world that wants everything to be gray. They want you to think that you don't know what a man and a woman is. They want you to think that there are no absolutes. They want you to think that the word of God is not true, that it's just a story and a fairy tale, and on and on and on it goes. We can't believe anything from the media. Everything in the world today is gray. And how do you get gray? Well, you take a little bit of white, and you take a little black, and you mix it, and the Bible calls that compromise. And God, in the very beginning, he gave us a decision that he had made, and he said, listen, I want the light separated from the darkness, and they are not to be together. You say, wait, what about the sun, and what about the moon? He doesn't make those for five more verses, guys. You see, the light in verse chapter 3 is the Lord himself, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us he is the light of the world, and we'll see that in just a minute. Pretty exciting when you think about it. And so it's important. Why did I say that? Well, remember, the Bible said that you and I were the inheritance. We got an inheritance. We are the saints of what? Of light. So what's God dealing with me? On the darkness I dabble in. You see, we got saved Because God is light, and God shined light into our hearts to see it, help us reveal that we were dark. But then you and I, the Bible says, are to walk in that light. Now, I know we're not perfect, so please don't go home today and go, wait, says I can lose my salvation. That is not where I'm going with this. But folks, in a world where there's a constant pressure on us to be gray, and to compromise our position on God's word and on our relationship with Jesus Christ, I believe more than ever the Lord is working on my heart to say, Wade, I am the light. And I need you to be the light. And I need you to be the cleanest light that you can be. Amen? So let's look at another passage, if you would. Go with me to... Uh, 
John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And as you're turning there, so how did our lives change? What, what really happened? Well, the Bible tells us in Psalm 119 and verse 130, it says that the entrance of thy words giveth light. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. And so here's what happens. You and I were in our darkness. And when someone shared with us from the word of God, the Bible said that that word of God then pierced into that darkness and entered light. And you and I began to understand things that we didn't understand. And bring us to the place where we could at least make a decision. Amen on whether or not to choose or not choose Jesus Christ. But why was that so powerful? Well, in John chapter 1, the Bible says this. In the beginning, verse 1, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. But the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, capital L. That all men through him might believe, but he was not that light. That is, John was not that light. But he was sent to bear witness to that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I'm going to share this with you because it was shared with me years ago and it's been very helpful. If at any time you're a Christian for very long, someone will ask you a question about what about some people group on the other side of the world that never hears the gospel. I'd like you to look at verse 9 again and the Bible says this. He lighteth how many men? Every man that cometh into the world gets some light. What you do with the light after you get it is on you. You say, wait, that sounds so hard. That's why the Bible says that the creation bears witness to the glory of the Lord. The creation is what unfolds to us that there is a God. That's why you have a conscience. Amen? None of those things were to save you, but all of those things were to move you forward into the process of saying, I'm not really sure what the whole picture is, but it's pretty clear that I don't have all the answers. There must be a God, because that's a pretty awesome live oak. I don't know how he did it, but the person looking back at me in the mirror is amazing. Good looking, pretty, beautiful eyes, amen. All those things, right? But let's be honest, guys, creation's pretty unbelievable. I mean, just what it takes for you to be able to see. It's kind of scary to think that that would have come out of some primordial slop and it just managed to evolve and then all of a sudden you would create cones and, and you'd have a retina and you could flip the image inside out and upside down so you would know that that would help you see it clear in your brain, which would then read. No, it's impossible, amen. And so the Bible says God lighteth every man, every woman that cometh into the world. Here's the problem. The world educates you out of it. Amen? That's why for us as parents, it's so valuable. You need to pour into your children, to your grandchildren. Because the world wants to educate them out of the glory of God. Amen. And so we see from here that Jesus is the light. So the Bible, then we can make a conclusion. Go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Here's the conclusion. I was in the power of darkness. And then I called upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says I was translated. That means I was moved. I was carried to the kingdom of his dear son. Or how about this? To the kingdom of light. Because Jesus is that light. Amen. John chapter 12, look with me if you would at verse 44. Jesus said, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me. 
but on him that sent me. And he that saith me seeth him that sent me, and I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide where? Amen. I want to, I want to say something because somebody will leave and misunderstand what I'm trying to say today. You do understand that if you make the decision for Jesus Christ, the moment you make that decision, you are translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. That is a one-time transaction that it's done based on our faith in him and what he did for us on the cross at Calvary. But upon having made that decision, we are then obligated to be engaged if we want to be any more than that with Jesus Christ. That's called your walk. Sometimes it's referred to as sanctification. I always tell people this. The easiest thing I ever get, did was get saved. The hardest thing I've ever done is walk with Jesus. Amen. So what I want you to understand is Jesus said, Whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. Praise the Lord. But you can be affected by the darkness in your daily walk. And that's what God's dealing with me about. And if any man hear my words, verse 47, and believe not, Jesus said, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, that will be the judge, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say, what I should speak. And I know that his commandment, hear me now, is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me, he was relaying to us the commandment from the Father which brings life everlasting. There is no way to have eternal life except in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is only the light. In fact, 1 John chapter 1 tells us this way, that in him, that is in God, hear me now, there is no darkness at all. Now, here's what's scary. When you and I became saved, when we put our faith and trust in Christ, when he regenerated us, when he birthed us anew, the Bible says he did a miracle in you and he made you holy enough and clean enough that he could insert his Holy Spirit inside of you. That is, you now are the vessel of pure light. Go to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 for just a second. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're coming down the home stretch. I don't need my buddy to do any dips or squats. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4. Look with me if you would at verse 3. Everybody there? But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds. He's darkened them. That was the state that we were all in before we came to Jesus. Of them which believe not, now watch, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I have people ask me a lot. I want to say something. I want to encourage you. That the Bible says, for the preaching of the cross is foolishness unto them which do not believe. They're ashamed of it. But for us, it's the power of God in it. Now listen, sooner or later in your life, you're going to have an opportunity to tell somebody what Jesus did for you. And I know that scares a lot of people. This is all I want to say about that. I only know one thing. I was in darkness, I was blind, 
Somebody shared with me about Jesus Christ and what he did for me. And light entered my soul, and now I have a full life. And all you have to give people is the gospel. Your job isn't to save them. Your job isn't to overwhelm them. Your job is just to tell them, I was this, he did this, and now I'm this. Amen. I was in darkness. He washed me in his blood. And I don't know how you wash in red and come out white, but that's how it works. Amen? And all my transgressions were blotted out, and everything went away, and I became a child of light. Hallelujah. So then he goes on to say this, For we preach not ourselves, that's the point, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Look at this. Isn't this wonderful? Reference back to your Genesis 1. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined where? In our hearts, amen. The light bulb came on to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's where we are. Well, if that's what Jesus has done for you, then I want to cover one thing real quickly. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, just for a second. Then I have one other verse to cover with you. So Jesus Christ did that for me. It now must compel me. It must move you. If you can allow people to do things for you and you feel no gratitude, you feel no moving of thankfulness, you feel no moving of wanting to do something at least for them, if it's nothing more than telling them how special it was what they did, then you're in darkness today. Or you've got a very hard heart and you think you're very entitled. But I want to say this morning, none of us was entitled to Calvary. None of us was entitled to everlasting life and deliverance from the pit of hell where the Bible says we'll be outer darkness. No. No. Jesus did an amazing thing for you and I that compels us to be thankful. And so the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now this is where I'm going to step on your toe, and, and then I'll be really nice and give you good news. Okay? This is what God's working on me about. Wait. You're light. So why do you watch that? Why do you read that? Why do you listen to that? You say, what? Really? You need to ask me about Netflix or TikTok or this world? Have we forgotten that the whole world lieth in wickedness? Have we forgotten that we're called to be different? Have we forgotten that God has desired that we should be clean vessels where the light shines? And can I say to you that Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 11. He said, if thine eye be single, if thine eye be full of light, then the whole body is light. Because the eye is the light of the body. You know what my mistake was? I thought it doesn't affect me. Is anybody else guilty? Am I like the only person who struggles with some of this stuff? You know where my problem is? I get tired. I get lazy. I'm just being honest, I get lazy. Oh, I have worked so hard, I deserve to watch a movie. Now, some of you know me, I'm really bad, but I love kung fu, right? I'm sorry, I'm just sad. Okay, no problem watching the movie. What one did you pick? And I'm 
harping on that because it's easy, but this is just my point. Since the world is so gray, and since we're constantly bombarded, we have to be even that much more on guard and that much more protective and that much more diligent to not allow any darkness to penetrate our ears, our eyes, our nose, our mouth, our senses, because it is going to affect your mind and it is going to bring you down because there is only death in darkness. And we talk so much about Romans chapter 1 and then we forget that the Bible says, and those that take pleasure in such things. Now, was that meant to offend you? No. I made it very clear before I started that that's what God's working with me on. Why? Because I would like our church to be full of light on an individual level as we try to make major decisions for the direction of this church. And if you think you can be dabbling in darkness and think clearly, you are absolutely wrong. Because a little bit of black makes it go gray. Amen. 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 Somebody dropped the lukewarm on you. <laughs> but I have really good news. Let's finish in Revelation 21. Revelation 21. I want to remind you that it has no effect on your salvation, only your walk and your reward. Once you're saved, you're saved. You're abiding in the kingdom of light. But our walk is in our power, folks. It's our job to stay in the scriptures and let the word enter light into us. It's our job to pray and let the Holy Spirit minister to us. It's our job to yield to his leadership and guidance in our life and to love one another, etc., etc., etc. And so here's why I want to finish here. So the Bible starts in Genesis chapter 1. With God bringing light, and that light is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would, look with me at verse 22 of chapter 21. And the Bible says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. This is so good. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Do you know that that light was so powerful that Saul, now known as Paul, couldn't stand? You realize that all of us that have put our faith and trust in Christ came into contact with that light and it humbled us. It broke us. I would encourage us that we would let it continue to humble us and break us. There's coming a day when we will enjoy that light for all of eternity in our glorified bodies. Amen. And there'll be no darkness. There'll be no sin. We'll be free from the power of it and the penalty of it and the presence of it. But in the meantime, let's be light. Amen. Do our very best in all glory to him who is the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the glory of your Son. And uh, we're overwhelmed, really, that you would shine that light into our darkened hearts. Thank you for the day you saved us, Lord. And so we want to give you all the glory and all the praise. And Lord, if there be one here that needs to go from darkness to light, I pray that they would just come up and ask. Maybe there's some of us, Lord, that, like myself, that you've been dealing with, and we just really haven't pushed to be as clean a vessel as you desired us to be. May we get that straight with you now. We love you, we honor you, we glorify you, and most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ. In his precious name we pray.